so fast that you don't even understand what he's saying. <laughs> Thanks, caller. I guess that's a Philly thing. Uh, are you uh, on, on this book tour? Are you going to go farther now? I mean, you're going out. You got more stops to do. Yeah, I'm actually going to be going to um, a number of college campuses, and I think that's that's really going to be. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of the book tour to, to, to take my message directly to college students. And I really, really think it's important um, for this generation of students to be uh, properly educated about the past so that they can be better informed citizens uh, today when we're discussing this really important debate about what the proper balance between civil liberties and national security is. Chandler, Arizona from Michelle Malkin. Good morning. Hi, Brian. Hi. Uh, Michelle, I'm asking you a simple question. Are you saying that John Kerry shot himself on purpose? I did not say that. Uh, no, those... I'm asking you a question. And this is and... exactly what Chris was trying to get to the bottom of last night. He wanted, and he said like uh, ten sentences later, I want a yes or no answer. Do you think he shot himself? No. And you would no. not answer that question, and then you continue to whine. Oh, he did. He beat me up because I would not answer. And you're the doing the same thing yes he did. Or no. And you're doing the same thing he did, which is not allowing me to answer the question. Now I will answer the question. No, I don't think he did that. And that's ridiculous for anybody who's actually read the book. The question is whether or not these self-inflicted wounds that were um, occasioned in one example because of uh, him firing a grenade launcher um, that led to a grenade that exploded too close to him and caused a shrapnel wound, um, whether or not that was worthy of, of the medal that he received. And again, as I say in another instance, um, questions raised by vets who were there with him at the time of the incident, um, whether or not there was even enemy fire. Um, and questions about how he received that second shrapnel wound, and in the third instance, whether or not the wound that he said he claimed he got from an underwa underwater mine explosion actually occurred earlier in the day uh, from a grenade that he threw into a cache uh, of rice to destroy it. Next. There you go. That's what I was trying to say and didn't get a chance to say on the show. Next show. Uh, next, show. next call, El Paso, <laughs> Texas. Go ahead. Yeah, Michelle. Yes. Yeah, this is Rick uh, here in El Paso, Texas. I'd like to congratulate you for the way you handled yourself yesterday uh, with Chris Matthews. I think what he was trying to do was he was trying to trap you into saying, putting words into your mouth. Really, uh, I never heard you say anything but that what the book said. You were referring to the book, which uh, you just said he, he didn't read. Um, I don't know. I, I really congratulate you in the way that you're handling yourself the way that you're defending your position. You know, I'm a Mexican-American, and I <laughs> I don't know how these guys, you know, are, are trying to defend John Kerry for all the flip-flops that he has gone through in his life. All through his life, you've been a flip-flopper. Uh, I congratulate you, and you keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank let, let me go back to the New York Times this morning, which has done some original reporting in this. Uh, this is a paragraph. George Elliott, one of the <clears throat> Vietnam veterans in the group, flew from his home in Delaware to Boston in 1996 to stand up for Mr. Kerry during a tough re-election fight, declaring at a news conference that the action that won Mr. Kerry a silver star was an act of courage. At the same event, Adrian Lonsdale, another Vietnam veteran now speaking out against Mr. Kerry, supported him with a statement about the bravado and courage of the young officers that ran the swift boats. Senator Kerry was no exception, Mr. Lonsdale told reporters, and cameras assembled at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, he also said he was among the finest of those swift boat drivers. Those comments echoed the official record. And it goes on that, that, that a lot of people who are now in this group against him mm -hmm were saying very positive things for him. What right. changed? Well, what changed, <clears throat> as far as I understand it, in some of the cases of these veterans, is that they didn't have knowledge about um, doubts um, from other veterans, and that when those doubts were shared with them, they changed their view. I don't think that there's anything um, condemnatory about that. <clears throat> there's also a fellow named Hoffman, Roy Hoffman, right. who is involved in this, and this right. is what the New York Times says about him. Mr. Hoffman had commanded the swift boats during the war from a base in Cameron Bay and advocated a search and destroy campaign against the Viet Cong, the kind of tactic Mr. Kerry criticized when he was a spokesman for the Vietnam veterans against the war in, 90, in 71. Shortly after leaving the Navy in 78, he was issued a letter of censure for exercising undue influence on cases in the military justice system. 
Both Mr. Hoffman and Mr. Lonsdale had publicly lauded Mr. Carey in the past, but the book Mr. Brinkley's Tour of Duty, while it burnished Mr. Carey's reputation, portrayed the two men as reckless leaders whose military approach had led to the death of countless sailors and innocent civilians. Several swift boat veterans compared Mr. Kaufman to, or Mr. Hoffman to the bloodthirsty colonel in the film Apocalypse Now, the one who loves the smell of napalm in the morning. The two men were determined to set the record as they saw it straight. It was the admiral who started it and got the rest of us into it, Mr. Lonsdale said. Yeah, I haven't read Doug Brinkley's book, and I will be reading it now. Um, and as far as I can tell about um, Admiral Hoffman, um, what I had read in Unfit for Command is that uh, before 2004, he had not been aware about some of the circumstances that had been introduced with regard to uh, Kerry's Silver Star Award, and that after he was informed by some of the veterans that were there that uh, it was a, a, a pre-planned um, um, operation, and it goes into details in the book, and people should read the book and see for themselves, but it wasn't until after he was informed of that um, that he, you know, publicly changed his mind about the statements he made about Kerry. New York City for Michelle Malkin. Good morning. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, uh, I would just like to uh, read from my upcoming book regarding President Bush's military service. Your book? There, I'm done. <laughs> in, a, in effect, nothing. Uh, and I wonder if Mrs. Malkin is planning any future books regarding President Bush's military service. As long as Kerry showed up in Vietnam, I don't care if he shot himself in the foot, if he shot other people in the foot, it, it was a rotten war over there, a lot of things happened, at least he showed up. And he's head and shoulders above our present commander in chief just on that point alone. What you know, uh, like other veterans who are criticizing him to to dig as much into President Bush's military record as they're digging into Mr. Kerry's service. All right, thanks. What is, in your opinion, what is really going on here? I mean, once you scrape, I mean, we we have argued here for three years with uh, folks about President Bush's military record and whether he served the last year. And if you're on President Bush's side, it's not an issue. If you're on Jaron Kerry's side, it's a big issue. Now, if you're on Jaron Kerry's side, this is not an issue. If you're on President Bush's side, it's a big issue. It doesn't really matter if you're on those sides what somebody says you believe what anybody's doing against your or for your candidate yeah i mean the views have really hardened on this but really again i just want to come back to the differential treatment of of bush and and Kerry on their war records and contrary to what this caller is saying um, the bush national guard records have been poured over extensively and um, overwhelmingly and the media has been dragged kicking and screaming um to talk about these allegations well, let me and, let me just, and, I I just want, okay go ahead I just want to, but almost all of the media have has have come to the conclusion that there is no story there i mean i've had with regard reporter, to bush yes i've yes. had reporter after reporter here say well we can't find anything we right. can't find anything right they can't and so that <laughs> is why now um there seems to be I don't know. It's just it's really interesting to me the way they're they're treating the story. And there's so many things that have gotten glossed over. For example, the Christmas in in Cambodia claims the the Kerry campaign has yet um, to explain away um, the discrepancies in facts in that case. And the media seems stunningly disinterested in finding out for themselves. Doug Brinkley deals with it in the New York Times article this morning. <coughs> this is what it says this week as its leaders spoke with reporters. They have focused primarily on the one allegation in the book that the leaders of the uh, Swipo group, that Mr. Kerry's campaign has not been able to put to rest that he was in Cambodia on Christmas Eve 1968, as he declared in a statement to the Senate in 1986. Even Mr. Brinkley, who has emerged as a defender of Mr. Kerry, said in an interview that it was unlikely that Mr. Kerry's swift boat ventured into Cambodia on Christmas or Christmas Eve, though he said he believed that Mr. Kerry was probably there shortly afterward. Let me just give the context about why this is important, because this seems to get glossed over, too. Kerry invoked the story about himself in 1986. He was giving a speech assailing President Reagan for um, war in Central America. And his point was that Reagan was lying to the American public about what justified going to war.